We're going to resume the, uh, the talk with uh, uh, Peter Jansen, uh, Peter Jansen's presentation, so please take your seats. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Appreciate it, Greg. I'll just grab a seat here then. Yeah, yeah. If you want to stay close, that'd be good. Okay. Very good. Yeah, um, the program uh, shares with you that my brother was going to make this presentation, and I, I was very, very happy that he was willing to do that. Uh, we, we were just start, still cranking the data from uh, mid-October, and it looked pretty profound and fantastic in, in the uh, traditional definition of that word as too amazing to appear to be true, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to share it with this group and get input from the range of physicists that are here and engineers and experimentalists who all know, you know how difficult it is to re do repeatable experiments. And our title is appropriately the empirical pursuit of Mach's principles. You're just going to see data, no theories from us. You guys know all the best theories, and we're hoping that you can think of a better theory to help explain what we're seeing. Uh, but they are experimental results that do indicate, and that's a specially chosen word, that a Machian inertial reaction force is actually possibly detectable. And I keep using possibly because uh, we have some fantastic results that hopefully you're going to help us sort out. And I, we also think it may be electromagnetic. And we'll talk a little bit about these organizations. I'm an associate professor in electrical engineering at Bucknell University. I also have my own consulting company, and I've had different people working with my consulting company to do these experiments. And I have a slide that actually talks about why integrated systems as opposed to the lab at Bucknell at the present moment. But the main aims are that we wanted to discuss these empirical investigations. And, 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 and that is the motivation for this research, uh, is we actually think we found a sensor. And, and, and it's, it's a sensor, a strange kind of sensor, because it's actually a very well-shielded battery. And you wouldn't think that it would behave as a sensor. But when you look at the results, you tell us whether you think it may be seeing something or not. And anyway, we also wanted to describe in detail our apparatus uh, so that you could actually work in this area, replicate our findings. We're not quite as big as a, a major uh, gravity wave detector. Uh, it's a very small device. But we wanted to share these very preliminary findings and our statistical outliers. Uh, as they've actually, These have been the things that have encouraged us to publish in what we've shared because we actually think we're, we might be onto something. And more importantly, we wanted to seek the broader input from this advanced propulsion workshop mock effect community uh, for possible better methods to detect and observe this potentially novel phenomenon. And uh, just before I get into some of these quotes, uh, it's really, really appropriate that we're sharing this at the second advanced propulsion workshop because um, when we came, my brother and I, to the first one, our main interest was to find out about all the amazing things that everybody was doing in mock effect because I had been fortunate that somebody in uh, Professor Woodward's email list 15, 12 years ago when I first got to Rowan and said, hey, we saw a mock effect research on your website. You might want to get on this uh, mailing list. And I said, I'd love to get on the mailing list. I quoted five of Professor Woodward's paper in my PhD thesis at Cambridge because I had all these strange effects and there was nobody else that was talking about these transient mass fluctuations and uh, somehow electromagnetically, et cetera. And I said, I, so I, I looked at all his papers. It's like, wow, I might be seeing the same thing that he's actually uh, doing. Um, so we'll talk about that in a moment, but obviously you, you probably already know the Hawking and Ellis uh, and various different versions of that statement, but we've seen right here local physical laws determined at the large, will determine the large scale structure of the universe. But the second one, being that most people here are very interested in Ernst Mach, this is the one that continues to motivate our research team. He said, I've remained to the present time the only one who insists upon referring the law of inertia to Earth. And in the case of the notions of great spatial and temporal extent to the fixed stars. I, I, I need you to sort of take that in because everything that we talk about when we give you these empirical data results sort of ties back to this idea of Earth being a considerable source of inertia as well as these distant stars and, and, and the rest of the very, very distant, potentially limitless universe. And of course, we know Albert Einstein is the one who actually is the first one who created the terminology, the Mach effect, Mach's principle. Ernst Mach, whose name it bears, actually said other things like this, but he never actually said something like the entire inertia of a point mass is the effect of all the other masses in the universe, deriving a kind of interaction. But I like this part. It said, from a kind of interaction. And that's Albert Einstein saying some kind of interaction. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but it's some kind of interaction. We think we've seen that interaction, and so we're pretty excited about it. And how did this happen? 
Well, it's sort of a very, very crazy story, like most scientific uh, investigations and potential discoveries are. I was working in the Mill Lane Laboratory in the Institute for Management, Department of Engineering at University of Cambridge when I was doing my PhD th thesis. And it was really cool because you're not, you can do what kind of experiments you want to do. And, um, and I was saying, you know, I believe, well, I'll talk about it in a moment, so I won't get into it in greater detail, but I saw some major anomalous data there, so that got me excited, sort of opened up this fascination for inertia to me. And then uh, the fact is, everyone in this room would agree that the origin of inertia remains a contentious topic. Engineers, like most of the people that I know, think it's got to be real because all the engineers I know have to design for the fact that inertia is everywhere, and if you don't design for it, people crash, die, and all those kind of things. But physicists, often a lot of physicists will say it's a pseudo force. Change the reference frame, it goes away. Um, there's increased interest, obviously, not only from this community, by, but by uh, physics community in large, if you read a lot of the new, new books coming out. And when I went to the Estes Park uh, propulsion workshop, the very first one, it became very clear to me that this is timely for us to continue to search and try to discover this new knowledge. And it actually, that time with you guys a year ago, because most of you were there, uh, was, was the thing that really super motivated me to go back and double down on these experiments. And two weeks later, on October 1st, um, we basically had these major hits that were the first time replicating the results that I found in Mill Lane in, in, a, in a way and, uh, and got us very, very excited. Now, just a little bit of the, the academic background. The only reason I'm sort of quoting these two workshops that came before our Colorado workshop is that I have two very, very nice quotes from these two books that have sort of kept me on track in, 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 the, in the pursuit. And the first one is, is, is if there is a moral in the early history of Mach's principle, its promise lies in the realm of empirical science, which is exactly what we're hoping to share with you today. And, uh, and this idea that um, we can bring the doctrine of relativity and Mach's principle into a physical theory that can be subject to experimental test and actually falsification. So that's where we're going to be heading with this. And inertia, again, one of our main physical properties, um, the idea that Ernst Mach proposes, the idea reflects a deep connection between the cosmos at large. And I got to say that because that sort of was a major learning moment for us when we said, we've got to be looking at the cosmos, not just our little local experiments here. And, that, and, and we think we've sort of identified some things. So let me take you back in time to that little Mill Lane lab experiment. And you might say, what are you doing playing with a gyroscope uh, you know, in a laboratory when you're doing your PhD? You know, because everything you should know about, about gyroscopes can be read in a book. But if you do go and read the books, what you actually find is that there's an awful lot of equations about how gyroscopes supposedly work, but nothing actually tells you underlying how they work, or why they do, or why they follow those equations. So as you go deeper and deeper and just say, well, what's going on? Well, I just had already adopted as part of my uh, uh, approach as I was looking for innovation in the electric power industry, this idea of... Popperian, after Karl Popper, sophisticated methodological falsificationism. And what that basically says for those of us who are, or those of you who are predominantly theorists in the room, is don't let theory stand in the way of your path forward. You have to assume that nature knows more about how nature works than our limited mind. And so when I was doing this discovery-driven investigation, it was like, okay, so the theories tell me that, you know, when you, when you spin up a gyro up to a very, very fast speed, it will continue to point to that same space in the universe that you spun it up at, and it will stay that, and the whole world spins around it. Why? Okay, well, there's a whole bunch of equations to tell you why it gets enough angular momentum, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's great. But what happens when you try to torque it? What happens when you try to take it off of that trajectory that it wants to stay on? Could anything happen? Could it be an observable thing? And also remember, most of our physical laws that we still use and hold dear, that are in our classical physics, uh, are based on experiments that were run 100, 150 years ago. So what would happen if we ran things now and we actually had more sophisticated observational techniques? So we ran this first functional model of what I'm calling my mock detector, uh, just to look at and understand inertia and, and basically try to learn a little bit about this intriguing gyroscopic phenomena. Well, we externally power this central inertial wheel until the gyroscopic properties manifested. Then I'd switch to the battery power, which you can't really see here, but the batteries were eight batteries back in here, very close to the central inertial wheel. And then we attempted to rotate it via a bungee to see how the system behaves. Well, in a, in a few uh, serendipitous observations, 
I, I was weighing the mass of this at the same time, in, in real time. And I don't know exactly how to turn this off, but there, I guess I get it. Um, well, I saw a transient mass fluctuation, which got me on to, well, how many other people have seen transient mass fluctuations? Got me into looking at Professor Woodward's uh, papers and things like that. But I also had this instantaneous battery polarity at the instant of that happening. The batteries went from 1.2 typical volt cadmium batteries, 1.3 volts. Some of them went uh, very, very negative, and some of them just went negative a little bit. And some of them were just greatly decreased, just in, in an instant, though. The yeah. wheel was driven by a, a motor that connected to the batteries, is that what you're saying? No. Yeah, okay, very good question, very good point. So in this first preliminary experiment, and these are fantastic, there was an external power supply to get it up to uh, rotational speed, which was totally separate from the batteries themselves. And then when this got up to inertial speed and could actually keep it so that the bungee wouldn't unwind, this is the primitive experiment, right? So that the bungee itself couldn't unwind because the gyroscopic power was strong enough to keep the bungees tight, then what we would do is unplug the... Uh, um, the DC power supply and switch these switches on to the battery power. So thanks, so thanks for the motor can act as a generator if you, if you run it backwards. Uh, we could never get the DC uh, motors to actually generate, okay. so so they were not that so kind they of. Motor. Reverse charge the battery by coming by changing their direction or something like. They, that. they couldn't in any of our experiments, but there are DC little DC motors. These are the same ones that you use in the Dremel tools. You know, like if you're trying to you know modify little. Uh, no permanent magnets. No permanent magnets. No, no, permanent no DC, DC. diodes. DC. Uh, there's it's a little caps on them, but um, so anyway. So, but what, basically, what happened was just this idea that maybe there's some interaction. Uh, uh, there maybe there's some interaction with this primitive experiment, and and we tried many times uh, to continue this experiment. I ran it many many dozens of additional times. Still saw a few of those transient mass fluctuations, but only got a few times with that battery polarity exactly reversal. Exactly what you saw about the polarity reversal, uh, I didn't get that. Yeah, so, so these, little, uh, these little NICADs, there's eight of them. Uh, when, they went into the, uh, when they went into the system, they were powered at full charge, so about 1.3 volts. And when the, when the system immediately crashed, um, I thought really the first thing you think is that there's some loss, you know, some wire came loose or something like that. But then when I actually investigated and pulled the batteries out, uh, I didn't actually put all the details into this slide presentation. But uh, you would actually measure the batteries and from the positive to the negative terminal, which you would have expected to see maybe a drop to 1.2 volts or 1.25 volts after the experiment, because it only runs for a short period of time. Uh, that actual positive to negative measurement on some of the batteries was actually a negative number. Oh. And, uh, so it was actually surprising that it would actually do that. And then I... When you <coughs> describe the system crashing, what, what, what phenomenon would occur when that happens? Yeah, so, so basically you're, you're in the lab and you'd already run 10 or 20 of these experiments and you normally what happens is you hear this and then the frequency starts to fall off as the, as the, as the uh, batteries start down. to die. And, and as they start to die, then the bungee sort of unwinds. The, the little device because it no longer has enough inertial capacity to keep it sort of oh. high, highly strong. But, one, but, but on a couple of these experiments that I'm referring to, the serendipitous events, you would hear and then it, almost as if it got into a certain directional beam or whatever, it went just stopped huh. instantly like that. So, and, the, so there, was, there, was, there was some kind of big torque was applied to the gyroscope. So well, the gyroscope always had that constant torque. Right, it had the constant torque of being wound by that by, by, by the bungee, bungee. Yeah, by the bungee. And so, but I'm talking on the torque on the wheel itself. That somehow the wheel basically stopped very quickly. Right, like like it just lost power. Like, but, but actually, it could have been like you said, almost like a damping, like so, something that actually damped. But I think what damped it. I mean, this yeah. is just all speculation now. But I think what damped it is the fact that the circuit that was driving it actually went almost in the opposite direction to sort of, you know, to, to electromagnetically shut down the current and try to put it in the other direction, which is very interesting because they didn't have enough power. Also, but, yeah, I get it. How long would the gyro run if you removed the battery power? Uh, typically, yeah. Uh, in, in that experiment, those experiments, uh, uh, probably about two or three minutes. So this is a very anomalous event. It was. It was absolutely very, very anomalous. Where did you get the gyro from and what kind of bearings were in it? We, we made this gyro. You made the gyro? Yeah, at the Institute for Manufacturing. Bushing bearings or were they actually? Just little bushing bearings, okay. yeah. And no lubrication? 
Uh, I mean, oil lubrication inside, okay. the, inside the building. So a lot of times people will ask you right away, why, why, you're a professor at Bucknell, you've been at Rowan University or Bucknell, why is this being done in your integrated systems laboratory? Um, and uh, the, there, there's not actually a quick, easy answer to that, but uh, the predominantly it's cost, because I've already spoken you know, to the president, the provost, my dean of engineering, and they're very happy for me to bring it on site. But the problem is the people that I pay to work with me are are employees of my consulting company. And they would also have to become Bucknell employees. And then there's all these legal things. And uh, right now, as most of us around this table know, resources are always challenging to come up with. So there would be the overheads of paying for those personnel if they were Bucknell employees and their benefits. Uh, right now, I pay all my employees as independent contractors. So that's the main thing that's keeping me from doing it so far. Again, we're, we're obviously continuing to hopefully get funding, and, could, and I will move it into my Bucknell lab. I do have a lab at Bucknell, and that lab has a lot of my photovoltaic and, and my research in grid tied uh, in, integration of uh, large-scale renewable systems. So uh, that is my goal. My goal is I will eventually bring it to Bucknell. But here's a little bit more of uh, you know, details about these little motors, um, because I wanted to sort of update you to last year. Okay, last year after the... Uh, conference that we had, you know, when I've been, you know, putting this system together. My sabbatical before I got the system built uh, from Rowan University Techs, and uh, which is this modified version of the machine. And then my last sabbatical uh, over the summer for my last sabbatical, which just ended, which is why I was able to t attend our workshop last year. Um, I actually got a chance to wire up the entire system. And basically what it is, and I'm calling it a scientific device now because I actually think it, it creates data that the, the community and I would be interested in. It has a central six inch inertial wheel, again, manufactured by uh, the Rowan University folks, two, uh, three to 7.2 volt uh, DC uh, Como motor drills. Uh, there's their model number, and it can achieve about 6,500 to 7,000 RPM, but always over 6,000 for our experiments. And then it has two DC uh, pancake motors, GPM uh, 9LR, which sit attached to that and that frame so that we can actually apply a torque that's more uh, based on electric power input as opposed to a bungee cord, right? Quick question. Yeah. Are these mag do these um, motors have permanent magnets? Can no. they act as, as uh, generators? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. So, so then... So basically, that just the main structure of this device was to say, I got this hit, but these batteries were very close to the motor, and, and we also didn't have but one side of the motor, or, or the, the, the inertia wheel, actually sort of sensing whatever that potential thing might have been. And I say sensing, because I don't know, we don't know for sure that that's what it is. But when you look at the results, I'll leave it to you to decide whether you think uh, this is just totally random or not. So we did make this spherical frame with eight arms, and we do label these eight arms like Alpha, Bravo. My, my nephew who works a lot with me works in the military. So he calls it like Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, all the way around to hotel, right? Which is H at the end. So we don't get confused. And uh, my nephew, I, I give a lot of uh, credit to my nephew because it takes two people to do this experiment. Uh, it's very difficult to do it by yourself. And then there's, as you can see, there's like six batteries on each of the arms. Uh, on two of the arms, we measure the voltage across all six batteries. And, and, and on the other uh, six arms, we have the voltage for the lower four. They're all tied into a common uh, positive and negative bus. So there are six, six uh, eight arms with six batteries in series. And then they're all in parallel in their connection to this. And, and, and this was a, a important factor. This was an important factor as we originally worked because we were concerned about the fact that, hey, if we're trying to get that force to come in and actually you know, interact with that inertia wheel, what are we doing when we've got 92% or 93% of that area that's totally vacuous? Am I going to be able to get an interaction with whatever it is, if anything is, coming in to try to stabilize the inertia of that wheel as we're trying to lift it up or bring it down or torque it? So, um, but that was in our minds. This is the other thing, too, is I, I'm just trying to unpack for you sort of this discovery-driven process because in our minds we were thinking, well, it's probably happening all the time, but we're probably just not getting in the, pr in the, in the zone where we could actually feel it. So when we weren't getting positive hits all the time, we just convinced ourselves, well, just do more experiments. And if you do more experiments, you'll get one out of 10. So that was what was in our mindset. Uh, the sensors themselves, I mentioned, they're these, these six 1.2 volt nominal NICAD batteries. We had the digital volt sensors there. Um, uh, there's their model number. And our experimental protocol is this. 
And uh, if we had the right kind of markers, I would actually you know, like to use them, but these are actually whiteboard markers and they don't do very well on paper. But the idea would be you're going to use external power to increase the inertia of the system, and then you want to use your battery power at this point, get rid of the AC grid that ran your DC power supply, and, and, and maintain the inertia by your batteries. And that's a totally separate system. You say, well, why? Well, we, trying to, we were trying to uh, keep the number of parameters, which we know are so huge in this kind of equation, um, to a minimum. So we wanted to just maintain the inertia by a separate DC system, and then observe the performance of that DC system after we shut it off at eight minutes. So we basically at four minutes, we power up for four minutes and then it runs to maintain that inertia. And then in eight minutes, we just shut off the DC batteries right at eight minutes like clockwork. Hopefully, it's, hopefully the batteries have used the same amount of energy during that period of time, although we don't have continuous energy monitoring yet. Um, but again, make sure you realize that we transitioned from an eight battery array basically to a 48 battery array when we moved to the system. And the original goal was we could run the system longer and potentially see and observe more things if we did that. And our main measurement of, uh, of what was happening was to measure the batteries uh, pre and post test. That was our main thing. So this is a very simple experiment, one that anybody could replicate. Where we have change in inertia of a wheel, we have batteries running it, the inertia of the wheel comes back down to zero, and we're looking at the battery voltage before and the battery voltage after, and everything should be normal. And as a matter of fact, when you look at my slides, you'll see things are normal. Go ahead. Just to, just to clarify, the battery strings yes. are six batteries per string, but they all feed into common into the common bus. Buses. Yeah, so the common bus up here has got the positive of all eight strings, so and the, uh, the black uh, wire bus down here has the negative so of all even, six. So you know, even if the motor turned into a generator somehow, it have to, though it doesn't, it, it would have it to would, power. It would have to affect all the batteries. It would have to affect, affect all the entire batteries. Exactly. Did you do any kind of analysis on each individual battery and its discharge, discharge time, no. its max voltage no. charge, and all that stuff? No. Okay, so you have no. all that variability in there. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you. So let me just say that we did submit our results uh, from our last, because after, after the Advanced Power Workshop, we were super excited when on October 1st, we got these amazing results. And I was convinced we got, we got some mock interaction. We got some mocking interaction going here. So we submitted it for peer review. Uh, we published it in IEEE Explorer. Uh, I'm not sure whether the reviewers all loved it or not, but anyway, they did say it could be published. And, and here, in fact, is the, the links you can get to it. I have a one or two copies of the paper right here, but I'm happy to email it to anybody who would like a copy of it. And, and the goal here was to try to get it out so other people could see everything that's in this device and could see whether they thought it was worthy of either replicating or, or telling me also, because I hadn't found uh, many, any, any major reasons why it shouldn't be. Although I'll tell you what most of my physicist friends and other engineers said in a moment. But this is basically what was in that paper. At that time, we were basically saying we run a ton of experiments, look at all of our pre-voltage pre range, look at our post-voltage range, look at the mean and standard deviations, say what should we expect here on the uh, control runs. And what a control run is, is during this period of time, there is absolutely nothing going on except maintaining the inertia of the system. And then we turn the system off. S uh, subsequently, I don't think it's a control run, but I'll tell you about that later. Why? I'm confused. I understand the spin up of the main rotor, but what about the torquing of the assembly? How do we spin those motors? Like, where did that so, so they have a separate set of batteries? That no, but I mean in the, the sense of your test plan. I mean, I see you turning on the main rotor, but then was there some point where, this, where that assembly is torqued? Then? Yes. So, so it, it, when, once we get it up, once we have it stabilized, uh, probably a four and a half, four minutes, 45 seconds is usually the time when it's stabilized at the battery, uh, what the batteries can put out. Because typically, this array of batteries, you can do the math, 7.2 volts, right? It usually takes it up to as much as the batteries can put out, which is as much as the motors can take, because those motors can run from 3 point to 7.2 volts. So, so we, we're putting, putting that in there. And then the idea is at four minutes and 45 seconds, we start applying torque one of those upper pancake or lower pancake motors and then the other one. And we sort of use a varistor to try to get a, enough torque applied so the thing doesn't start spinning like a contact movie, you know what I'm saying? In the contact movie, right? Remember how they got the gyro going this way and then the gyro going this way and then all of a sudden they got, made a wormhole. But 
that's not what we're trying to do right at this moment. <laughs> what we were trying to do is just try to find some steady application of torque to this, to this wheel. And so what we found was that the standard deviation uh, within, uh, you can see everything happens what you would expect. Is this a histogram? What, what does that Yeah, so the histogram here tells you what my distribution of batteries was going into the experiment. Okay, so this is what their voltages were from 1.33 to 1.38. And then these so are the- thing means 100 batteries? Uh, yeah, there's 100 batteries that were in that part of the distribution, because this is multiple experiments, right? Multiple experiments. So, so this, is, this is what we got coming out uh, of the, uh, con what we thought were control runs at the time. Control runs being we just ramp it up, maintain it, and let it fall back down. Knowing all the time, though, that the batteries are in the sphere all the way around this, this part. And then, <coughs> then what we had, yeah. that point clear, that was on the control run without the disturbance. Right, so without any disturbance. Then this is what we call the experimental run, which is about minute 4.45, uh, we actually began to apply torque by turning on those pancake drives to try to make this thing turn. And as my brother would always say, to see if we could make the universe blink. Okay? That's what he always said. We're going to look for and see if the universe would blink. And the only thing that you see a little differently is maybe the uh, voltage fall off was a little bit more on average, i.e., is that possible? Well, physics would say it's not possible because there shouldn't be any re reason why these guys should be under greater strain. Sure. So, so you have a skewed uh, distribution for the post-test voltages? Yeah. This is a skewed distribution. Yeah, and so we're leaving it actually for the results that we're going to share with you about what we've just done recently. We actually have a whole two or three people that just their masters and their PhDs are in statistics to try to help us sort out whether there's anything underlying this. But this was what the first experimental data that we wanted to share. We had this information going in to that experimental run, and then we had this post coming out. A little bit more, uh, standard deviations were a little bit higher. So from 25%, the standard deviations went up to 38%, and from 69 63 millivolts, it went up to 82 millivolts. So what's the reason why you have a skewed distribution for the post-test? Uh, battery discharge curves aren't linear. Battery disturbs are not linear. That's what Mike said. So I agree with that. It's like a Poisson like distribution or what? Uh, it's like you take so many joules out of a battery, the voltage doesn't fall linearly with the energy. Right. Uh, the discharge curve is not right. aligned. So, it's like curvy. So I was asking about if they did an analysis of the discharge rates of each one of these batteries that they're using. Right, which is the answer is no, because we're constantly taking batteries that we think are damaged out of the system and putting new batteries in, but we always keep the same batteries in any experiment. The other thing to remember is that every time we run another experiment, not only another 48 batteries, but they're always randomized. So a battery never appears into the array in the same location because we're trying to minimize sources of, of continual disturbance. So here's again another little picture of how this actually sits in, in operation. Okay, it's normally either horizontal, 10 degrees, 20 degrees. You know, we're at 40 degrees north latitude, and the idea is if you want to interact with the, at least in our solar system, you'd sort of be, want to be at a tilt angle of latitude, you know, if you wanted to interact with the plane of the, the solar system uh, because of uh, the way our, and again, but we, we kept it at 10 or 20 degrees because the Earth also has its own, uh, uh, own tilt, as you know. And, and again, just for reference purposes, the, while the array is fixed and the detector is fixed, if we looked at each one of these arms from A through H, they're all labeled, and that's how we keep track of where every Every battery that's actually also listed, you know, it has its own. We're actually trying to do a history now of the batteries. You know, over the 10 or 15 times they have been in experiments, how have they uh, maintained? So we have that data log being built now. Uh, but so every battery has its own little um, uh, uh, information on it. And then what we were basically saying was, okay, how we read the detector is we say what was happening on these arms and where were these arms sort of facing in terms of looking at the world. So the interesting thing that came up in these October experiments, which got us to feel like we have to at least put it out there, and that's all we're doing today, put it out there so that people can help us get into a much better position of knowing what it is we're possibly seeing, was this October 1st experiment. And I haven't said anything about the sky yet, okay? Because we didn't know anything about the sky until, again, my brother and my wife said, well, if you think it's all Machian, why aren't you seeing what's in the sky when all these things are happening? But we'll get to that in a moment. But in the meantime, what we had on October 1st was we had a sequence of three experiments right after one another that actually had, a, again, another major shift in uh, voltage. Uh, this one went out to, down to 0.69 volts. This one went out, this is a second experiment. 
uh, went down to 0.75 volts, and this third experiment went down to um, 0.98 volts for that battery. And if we look- one particular battery in each of those. That's a one battery in this experiment out of 48, one battery in this experiment out of 48, thank you for that question, yeah. And one battery in that experiment. And the interesting thing was, if you actually take a look at our data distribution of this, which is all of our experiments, and you compare it with these three outliers, what you can see is if you assume those outliers are actually part of the distribution, that they're actually real, they're just normal, they should have happened uh, by chance, because that is a somewhat normal distribution, although I'm gonna leave it to my statisticians to prove that that should have been a somewhat normal distribution. Basically, you would find that there was about a 17.2 17 sigma, 15.4 sigma, and 8.8 .8 sigma. All of those, by reference, are um, the two observations of the gravitational waves from LIGO had a five sigma significance. But they're convinced it's true, and from seeing the slides and seeing all the data, I'm convinced it's true, all the legal but, observations. Uh, like uh, McCall said, uh, which is not in the room now, uh, the, first of all, the distribution is skewed, and number two, um, you don't expect it to be, what happened to him? You don't I think he told me he had to leave room. Yeah, you don't, exactly. you don't expect it to be a Gaussian distribution. It could be, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and you have, sorry? So talking sigmas implies Gaussian distribution. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. so definitely now you have a non-Gaussian distribution if you're talking about uh, the 17 sigma, right? So, so the question is why why you have a non-Gaussian distribution? But you may, but you you are in the stock market, which is uh, yeah, 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 yeah. long tail. So, so you, you have you have very very long tail. But if you but in the stock market, you have that all the time, and if not, uh, so the big thing, right? If you have a crash right. in 1987, you have a long tail. Right, very good. And so, um, let's just talk about it. Um, what are the alternative explanations? This is just totally random. Battery failure, and close proximity, maybe there's a strong magnetic field. Uh, potential back EMF, is it possible that we're getting any through the DC motors? There's a mismatch uh, battery impedance. Uh, human error? Well, obviously, we're doing experimental research, and everybody who's done it, we're done in experimental research, you know there's human error involved. But we convinced ourselves that we should keep going, that the explanators that we could get from those were not enough. Battery failure, the only reason we said that those three outliers could potentially be real was that was the position of the setting sun. It was almost setting. It was actually still four o'clock, I guess, in the sky, but the sun, Virgo, and moon were aligned here. And this is where it moved to in the next experiment. And then this is where it moved to in the next experiment. So it actually could have been totally random. But we convinced ourselves that if it was random, why was it tracking astronomy as a random event? What would make you think even to look at that? It's a Machian effect. The sun and the moon align, well, you'll see it in another slide with the eclipse, the one we have from the eclipse that we did on August 21st, okay? So we, we did do uh, magnetometer readings when it was up at 7,000 RPM, the fastest we could get it. We didn't see any significant elevations in magnetometer readings that would suggest. We didn't think that we had a, any electrostatic phenomena going on nearby, although that wasn't exhaustively measured in my uh, laboratory. No grid connection during the key part of the experiment. Uh, these were parallel strings, the point you brought up before, John. You know, these were parallel strings, so if there was any back discharge, wouldn't it have affected all 48 batteries? Why would it uh, systematically affect batteries? There's a mismatch of battery impedances. Definitely could lead to vulnerability of the sensors. The batteries themselves sharing unequally the load. As a matter of fact, some of the most fantastic results we see almost indicate that there's some, uh, must be some impedance differences in the strings when uh, we see how they, how they separate. Uh, again, I said human error is always a possibility. This is where I'd like to have George Hathaway in the room. <laughs> <laughs> All of us remember, you know, with his exalt, I know, I know, you, you, I have a whole bunch of Q&A for the end, right? Can I just get through the story before we get, yeah, I really appreciate it because it, it is a fascinating story. So when we thought that it was Definitely due to missing the mark, we made the Death Star. <laughs> okay? And, and we learned something from the Death Star, because we thought for sure when we built the Death Star, we would see it all the time. Okay? What all the time? 
this interaction, this, uh, this, these, these, these massive fall-offs that could always point to something that was real. Okay? But in fact, that wasn't quite in our mind yet, really, when we built the Death Star. We, weren't, we were starting to think about the sky, but quite frankly, we hadn't thought really, really heavily about the sky. So you still had the arms in here, which are power arms. The uh, Death Star shields, as we would say, had, were, were not powering anything except the digital voltmeter. So you, we went from the Cambridge experiment, where we had more than two or three amps running through those batteries, there's eight of them, to where we had eight arms, where each string was carrying about one and a half amps, to now the shields only have probably one and a half milliamps running through them in order to keep those little DVMs alive. And so even though we didn't have any big perceptible hits with the Death Star, we started thinking, well, maybe it's an interaction that's electromagnetic with the current that's running through these devices, not just the material of these devices. So anyway, so this would happen. We actually started saying, well, what are our assumptions? And how have we potentially been limiting our ability to change and to grow and to discover new things because our assumptions were so tight? And our success, we think, was what was holding us back the most. We had had these dramatic hits, so we thought they would happen all the time. And then we were able to replicate what we thought were these dramatic hits in Cambridge, and we're saying, we're on the track. It's got to be these dramatic hits. And so we're only looking for big events to happen. And, uh, and we also just thought, like, well, it's just got to be taking, cratering the battery voltage. That's what we're looking for. And, uh, but all the time, when Eric came to do some of the experiments with me over the January time period, he kept saying, well, look, I think you're right. And I think there's something here. I think the data is sort of suggesting we've got to keep looking. But um, if, if it is real, it's happening all the time. The Mach effect can't be just happening uh, just when these big events happen. Maybe you're just in some special location where vulnerability of battery, blah, 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 which makes it look really big, but it's got to be happening all the time if it's real. And, and that's, that sort of, sort of started to shift our idea that if there are these Mach effect impacts, and if they were measurable, would they directly affect the battery physically? That's what we thought it was doing. You know, we just thought it was cratering the, you know, the construction chemically or otherwise of the battery. And we, then we started to think, well, maybe it's some sort of electromagnetic interaction. And what was it in the sky that uh, what was in the sky was not important to us? We were never thinking. We just run experiment, 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 experiment. And then we, what happened in this last year, which is why, why I'm actually here, right? Because I was just going to have Eric share this stuff and have you guys just beat holes in it all, and I'd feel really bad because he'd get the arrows in his back like Jim did when he first started going down the mock effect. And I'd be down, and I'd be calling in at the end and having a really bad connection in Skype or on the phone, and you guys would be asking me a question. I wouldn't know what you asked, and you wouldn't know what my answer was, and you're saying, these guys are full of it. But anyway, so what we did was we said, let's change our, let's learn from what we've done so far. Let's start to look to the sky maps for some direction. We know what the Earth's going to do. The Earth's here all the time. But what is the sky telling us? And, and we wanted to try to reduce the clutter in the batteries, because if it's happening all the time, we've got to find some way to take as much error out of our measurements there as we could. And, and part of that error was the fact is, you know, the grid changes all the time. And even if you supposedly have a constant voltage battery supply, it depends on the charger, it depends on who you buy it from, whether it's really a constant voltage or not, whether it's just totally dependent on the grid, okay? And so the grid goes up and down, you read your batteries, you sure enough find them higher voltage when the grid was higher voltage, and you find them lower voltage when the grid's a lower voltage. So all these things forced us to say, and, and this is another thing too, even though there's only, there's, the, what happens is, re, I told you that we have to let this thing spin all the way down because we don't think the experiment's ended until the inertia's out of the system again. Well, that's eight minutes by the time we read the very last battery from when the battery was shut off. And during that time, what happens? Rebound, right? These batteries rebound. Their voltage will come back up. It will never come back to what it was before, but it will start coming, climbing back up. And so what we did was we started accounting for rebound, measuring the set before and after to say, well, what did it bounce up in that time? Let's say, what was it at the time that experiment ended? What was, what, if we could have instantaneously looked at it in real time, what it would look like. And so we started to account for that rebound. Tiny little bit. Again, we're, we're reading like 1.2375, and we're going to change it by 5 millivolts, uh, which would be 0 0.005 or 0 0.015. Uh, so you know what you know to the drill. And then we said, let's try to run some of these experiments during predicted significant celestial alignments, because if, in fact, Mach's principle is there all the time, pulling in all these different directions, during those alignments, it may have a little bit more bias than otherwise would be expected. So here's where we sit, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, right here at the 75% of the eclipse. How many people watch the eclipse? Uh, I love the eclipse. 
I mean, I wish I could have been in this zone here. But instead, I, instead, I'm up here in my laboratory running these experiments that I'm showing you today because I love the mock effect. <laughs> anyway, so this is, uh, I wish we had the astronomer. Is there any astronomers in the room? Well, I, I wish we had an astronomer because this is basically a sky map. This is uh, west. This is east. This is, if you're looking south, and, and it basically would be the sphere that would be over your head looking south, going back this way. So that would be your east, that would be your west, and this would be what's in the sky. And, and, and as predicted, obviously, I'm trying to look for the eclipse. The eclipse is right overhead at that time, which is why I'm running the experiment at that time to see what could possibly happen. We had an astronomer that was supposed to give a presentation. Is he watching by Skype, or he's not connected? OK, so here's another one of my random battery changes, which, which sort of got us Excited. First of all, we just said it, it, it can't be real. Okay. I mean, we're just like you, incredulous when we see this. First of all, it can't be real because we had the echo arm was hit by whatever this is that we think it might be a mock reaction. One through four and number six of the echo batteries gained 140 millivolts per battery. The lowest battery, I'm sorry, gained 140 millivolts. The other ones were 95 millivolts, 105 millivolts, 114 millivolts. But on that same arm, Echo's highest battery lost 140 millivolts. So he has six batteries in series. One goes up. Uh, five of them actually increase their voltage. One goes down based on their starting voltage. And the Echo arm points directly to the Earth response. So if you go to my picture here, you know, if you remember my picture here of the, of the device, this it changes all the, the orientation of this changes all the time, but it happened on this experiment, A, A was up. So the Earth response was basically facing straight down, and the echo arm that was the lowest on the detector, hanging towards Earth, uh, experienced these swings in voltage. This one and these five. That's, that's the six batteries in the echo arm. Are these <laughs> the unloaded batteries, no, just running a voltmeter? Uh, say that again? You said there were the, this is the like groups of batteries are only running a voltmeter, not running any motors. No, no, uh, yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, the, the, this, this is the Death Star is not in operation here. We just have the original experiments we did um, in October first because we were uh, we were just using it without the Death Star batteries. So they're all running motors. These are all running motors. All under current. These are all under one and a half amps of current during that maintenance time. Um, and then, of course, when it came to the next experiment at 239, the sun and the moon had sort of shifted, still in somewhat of a great alignment, but it shifted over to the hotel arm. And this is what happened. All of a sudden, you start to look at it, it starts like a normal redistribution. This is the thing when we started getting chills. I mean, this is just us, because we're, you know, again, we're, we're sort of a little crazy because we're scientists. But we saw that the lowest arm in the system is the hotel arm. And the, I mean, the lowest uh, battery in the system is on the hotel arm. The highest battery in the system is on the hotel arm. And in fact, the hotel arm is pointing directly to the eclipse. And the Bravo arm, which is the lowest arm, uh, was actually, when I say lowest arm, I mean, if you were to average the voltages, the, the change in voltage on the battery, the entire six, volt, uh, six batteries on the arm, the arm that had the lowest uh, delta would be the Bravo arm. And that was pointing directly to Virgo. So what this did for us was change our mindset. We said, it's possibly happening. It may be happening in both these experiments. And if it is, maybe these are things that we start, need to start looking for. Things like, it's a normal distribution or skewed distribution well, actually, coming you went, out. You went from uh, before having uh, five tails, now what you have is a cluster distribution. <coughs> because they, uh, during the eclipse, the, what you have is not anymore right. an outlier. You have a cluster there. Absolutely. So, so it is a, it's a bimodal distribution you have now. Very interesting. Yeah, that's why that's why we need our statistics help. That's why we're sharing this data as as un, you know. This is most of these slides that I'm showing you right now. I made on the airplane coming out when when I knew you know we we, we needed to show you the most recent data because that's how amazed we were by it. So this recent. Uh, uh, reenactment it's very very hard to see but if you follow this blue line which is still very high to see this is the Virgo constellation and there's the moon and the sun 
in the Virgo constellation. I'm not sure what's significant about the Virgo constellation, which is why I was going to ask uh, the astronomer in the room. I do know that the Virgo supercluster is the uh, supercluster that the Milky Way is in. It's the largest massive formation of galaxies within 100 million light years. So it's close and it's big uh, and therefore probably very, very massive in the near scale. And the fact is that this sun moon in the Virgo supercluster is what happened on October 1st when I had these anomalous results that skewed my distribution. So we knew this was coming on the 19th, so we started doing experiments on the 18th. We ran in the 19th, 20th, and the 21st because there was still very close alignment of these devices. And we moved it up from the basement into the first floor because we were concerned about the earth effects. We're thinking like we don't know exactly why, whether these earth effects could be really big. But this shows you what it looks like in, in its mode ready to be run. Um, and in fact, uh, you can see you know, the labels on the arms you know, to make sure we all know where we're loading it up at after we measure all our batteries. The tails come down or either connected to the voltage source while we get it up to speed on the ramp up. Then we pip those off and connect them to the battery sources for the four minutes of maintenance, and then we shut the system down. So this is our protocol. Just so you know, we measure the battery pre-voltage. We load the device with those screen batteries randomly. We have the four minute protocol via the grid to build the system inertia. Here's the protocol. Two volts for 30 seconds, two volts, 30 seconds, three volts, three volts, four volts, four volts, five volts, five volts, and then we connect it to the, to the seven put nominally seven volt battery system, because you'll see as soon as we put it under load, the voltage collapses immediately once the batteries are under load. Go ahead. So in the, in, even in the first step, measure pre, pre battery pre-voltage, is this you're measuring each individual each battery individual on a battery. voltmeter, right? Each individual battery each on a voltmeter. Each individual volt. battery on a voltmeter. How long does that process take per battery, and did that vary? Because to run that voltmeter, you're going to drop the voltage. That's right. So, yeah, so, so basically, to we took the measurement. No, just one measurement. OK, one measurement. Well, we're, just so you know, we're, yeah, we're just trying to see if there's anything here sure. at this point. We're, we're, we're not into great refinement yet. So. Can you just go back three slides? Um, so in the first experiment, the arm that, was, that had a response was the one that was furthest away from the eclipse, right? That's the one that was the closest and to the Earth. That's the closest to the Earth. But then in your second, your second experiment, when the eclipse had moved, uh, yes, the response arm was the one that was closest to the eclipse, right? The hotel arm is the closest to the, it's not the arm, it's there's the highest and lowest battery. Right, right, right. right. So on, on, this, on this distribution, this battery and that battery were the ones that were closest to the eclipse, that's correct. Right. So, so in the first one you have the responses, <coughs> the anomalous responses in the arm furthest away. In the perfect alignment between the sun and the moon, yeah, exactly. Right. But, but, but why the inconsistency? Why moving from the furthest away to the closest? I, I have no what idea. What did you expect? I feel like that new book that just came out. We have no idea. Okay. You, you read that book? <laughs> well, because, uh, Astrophysicist <laughs> and, uh, and the PhD cartoonist? We have no idea? I mean, I, I, I love that book. I just, I, I just worry a little bit about you know, confirmation bias creeping in here. Absolutely. Because, I mean, if, if, if you're looking at significant arms, you know, in the, in the one with, during, during the total eclipse, you could say, oh, the, the arm closest to the eclipse had a response, or, oh, the arm furthest away, and the eclipse had a response, and you know, you've only got eight arms. And if you get right. two, so, so, two so positive the math. significant, you've got a 25% chance of thinking that Absolutely. there might be something significant. Absolutely. Right. That's why I want to show you the data, okay? Because I, I want to show you that data, because that way we can see if bias from us looking right. is potentially interacting with the uh, objective data. Uh, and you guys can tell me that, you know, uh, again, I, I have a couple buddies that said they needed a little more time than, you know, few days when I got the data done to come to this conference that we'll, we'll, we'll do the statistics with me to see if there's enough, if we have enough degrees of freedom to say anything about this data other than, well, it seems like it's uh, coincidental, which, which, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, so anyway, so we go through that. We monitor the motor temperature. At, at, at the same time, we're taking these measurements. We're also taking RPM of the motor and, uh, and temperature of the motors and the DV, digital voltmeter. Uh, telling us we apply a torque if it happens to be an experimental run. No torque is applied if it's, a, if it's a control run. Terminating the batteries at eight minutes. And then after the last spin, when that happens, we turn off the voltmeters and we start doing these post-battery measurements. Uh, we just added this recently, the 5 to 12 millivolt rebound based on the actual rebound measurements that we do. And then we load the data into Excel and we look for these things. And if we're looking for three or f two or three or four things and we only have eight arms, 
Well, there's a very high probability we'll find them. That's actually in our spreadsheet. What's the probability if you're looking for this and it happens to have hit two or three arms? Now you don't only have two or three arms involved because you said already that you had two or three ground arms, right? So if you start picking eight arms, you can hit it every time, right? So actually you don't even need eight arms to hit it every time. You just need maybe seven or six and you could almost hit it every time. Yes? Yeah, um, Peter, just a, a quick question. Um, were you using uh, nickel cadmium cells for, yes. the whole, for all of these? Well, it was always nickel cadmium. Um, I've been a big radio control enthusiast since I was a kid, and, and uh, I have some experience with um, uh, those kind of cells. And I was wondering, first of all, Every experiment you did, did you use brand new batteries that were, no. that were preconditioned, or did you reuse batteries? No, no. So, so basically, over, since last year, which would have been uh, when we started buying the batteries and measuring them and putting them through, we, we started out with like probably five sets of batteries, which we kept in their own group, and we would continue to read them and measure them up. And then, uh, then we did start adding new battery sets, usually in a set of, uh, you know, like another three or four packs so that we could keep those sort of mixing up too and then we would try to pull batteries out that we seemed like they wouldn't hold a charge so we did start a whole screening process of um, you know you could put it in the charge the little light comes up to green but then it comes out and it only came up to 1.28 volts or something so if anything was less than like 1.32 it never made it through the screen so then we would have to bring in new batteries that had been previously hardened that's what my nephew likes to call it my military nephew he basically says well we need to hard if you harden the batteries they're less they're less sensitive than the new batteries the new batteries are really seem to be much more or less set up maybe is that your experience or no uh well i used to race like uh 112 scale off-road uh rc cars right. and uh it was really important to make sure that the, all the cells were balanced. Yeah. And even after doing that, sometimes after a couple races, um, you know, I'd always check each each cell, and, and there might be one cell that that would not hold the charge. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know if that's uh, because of transient mos mock effect. Uh, that's it's interesting, though. I mean, it could, it, but it, but it could be, you know, the same exact phenomena that we're seeing. No, one chart, one one is uh, impedance is differently, therefore it takes the load differently, therefore it discharges differently, and. Can I get through the data though, and then you guys can sort of because we got a lot of time to talk about it. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. What's the, what's the load on your batteries when you're playing with them? Uh, the um, I think it's 1.2 to 1.3 volts per per right. cell when I was current. using when I was using the um, the nickel cadmium cells. Now now nowadays everything's lithium ion. Right. And uh, when, when my buddy came up from Rowan University to, to validate, he says, "Why are you using ICAT? Why don't you move to lithium ion? You know they're not, they don't uh, have." That was going to be my next question. Yeah, and he, 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 it was going on, and I said, oh, "You know, you want to know the answer? The answer is fear." You know, you think you're on the hunt of something. There's so many variables to control for. That's, I don't want to add another variable yet unless I think I have it. But now that I think I saw something, I definitely will put a whole set of lithium ions through the whole thing and some other t battery types to see if this holds up. But let me just get through the experiment because we only got 15 minutes. We only got 15 minutes before the uh, thing is. And I want to pre preface this by saying we double checked our data. It doesn't mean it's perfect. We haven't had a chance to do statistical analysis yet. I, most of these slides you're going to see coming up were all done on the airplane, you know, coming out here because we just had the data come out the 21st was when we finished experiments and I had to teach class. I had to catch up with that whole week of experimenting, grading kids stuff. You know all the deals. The preliminary results are encouraging, but we are just beginning, okay? And uh, the statistical significance methodology is currently under development. I mean, your point exactly. We don't even know if this is statistically significant. We only have eight arms. But what we have to share is, here's our 21 exper 23 experiments. This is the times that they kicked off our experimental numbers, whether we thought they were a control or whether we thought they were an experiment. The only difference between a control and experiment is whether torque is applied while we're up at the top of that. And, uh, and again, reminding you that here's how we start to limit our degrees of freedom because we're basically saying since this thing can turn a little bit because even though it's being held by bungees, it's actually got a flexible connection so it can rotate. So we're, we're calling these potential earth arms. Those meaning they're pointing towards earth. Yeah, they're pointing towards earth, right. They're, the earth's down there. The earth's down here. Earth's down here. It's on its side. 
these arms, if you were to look, what are they looking at? They're looking at Earth, whereas the other guys on the side are point, looking at the horizons. And then the guy that's pointing straight up is looking overhead, okay? So then, to answer your point, we said, okay, why did we even pick this draft possible interaction matrix? Because it's got too many possible data points we're adding to it. We're saying, I want to look at the high arm, I want to look at the low arm, I want to look at the high battery, I want to look at the low battery. Sometimes that happens to be two, but sometimes that could be three. And if you start adding, adding three potential targets, um, you know, and you already had three arms for your Earth, you could get up pretty high pretty quick. But, uh, and, and the little asterisk here, all that says is that the, uh, the data points that were put in here for high and low were not more than, assuming a normal distribution, were not more than two sigma uh, away from the mean. Okay, whereas the rest of the high and lows were two sigma from the mean. So what I'm gonna show you is the summary results, which got us pretty excited, okay? Which is that 100% of the runs pointed to the Earth as target mass on an average of 1.9 or two of those indicators that I just gave you. 1.9 or two of those indicators were saying Earth was there. 73% of the runs pointed to the Virgo complex, the sun or the moon. Uh, obviously they were in alignment for a couple of those days. 91% um, of the time the low arm pointed to target mass. 83% the high battery was seemed to be pointing to a target. 74% the high arm seemed to be pointing to a target. And these are and then 65%, the lowest battery seemed to be pointing to a target. And I say seemed to be, and possibly, because this is just our preliminary analysis of the 23 experiments, right? Um, the visible target masses could correlate directly back to the high-low arms for 78% of the 96 possible hits. But what do these results mean? You know, is it just coincidence? Um, if you look here, and again, as soon as you start seeing coincidences, you start to look for, well, is there any natural pattern here? that could suggest to me that maybe it's real. And so this, what we did was we said, okay, here's our Earth East arm. If you remember, the bottom of the detector had an Earth East, a center, and an Earth West, the one that goes right down to the middle. Well, the middle one got hit 14 times in these 23 experiments, the easterly one nine times, and the other one eight times. And again, I don't know if that's normal, because only three data points. But it's very interesting that it clusters around the center to me. It's very interesting that it clusters around the center because it sort of suggests that there might be a pattern there in the, uh, that we're actually maybe detecting something real because that's what you would expect. You'd expect the one that's pointing straight to the core of the Earth might have the greatest mock response than these other ones. Again, it's all this assumption that it could potentially be a mock assumption. And then you can see out of those four potential, and I say four potential indicators because I don't even know if, if, they're the, if we're looking at the right thing as those four potential indicators. We just, that's what got us on the hunt. What got us on the hunt was, why are these batteries being skewed out? Why is, why is there a high and low in the same arm? And why is that arm pointing to something which, why should it be pointing to anything? And again, in that case, in that just one example, it's like that's one out of an eight chance that it should be pointing. That that one essential arm that did, had all these things manifested on it, it shouldn't be pointing to anything. Well, why is it pointing to something that could potentially be called a mocking inertial molecular mass, if you happen to believe that? which I, I'm not a physicist, so I'm just throwing data out there that was, we found very, very compelling. So we get this little bit of a distribution centered around the Earth arm. We look at these possible hits by Virgo, and we see that 26% of the time it could have possibly implicated this Virgo supercluster direction, 18 times, 17 times, uh, respectively, the sun and the moon. So 27 potential additional interactions from those features. And, uh, and then we also had uncorrelated possible hits. So there's 20%, there, there, there's, the, there's, there's the 22%, I mean, the 20 uncorrelated possible hits. Uh, again, I don't want to go so far as to say, are there, are there dark matter targets at those specific locations that are very low, close? I just wanted to give you the experiments and let you maybe give me some feedback and Eric some feedback and, and us, of, you know, whether we're on a so, so, totally wild goose chase here or whether or not there may actually be something about the fact that, you have your hand up, John? Yeah, I was just going to ask. I, I know this is very early, and you're looking at a kind of strange new phenomenon. Have you thought of maybe putting like little Hall effect sensors around some of the wires? That, that would be awesome. That would, that would be awesome. Right? I mean, I, I'll show you one last slide uh, okay. in, in, in this data where we actually had installed at the last minute um, uh, real-time voltage sense oh, okay. on three of the arms okay. that were up on the top. 
so we could actually see if, if there was anything different that was happening in terms of voltage. But I love the idea of Hall effect sensors. And, and I, have my pad of paper up here. I have my pad of paper up here because during question and answer time, we're just hoping, you know, we're really hoping that Martin's going to, you know, take over George's place and, and give us all we sorts have of things. Hall or Gowski effect, you know, that they are very non-invasive. They don't interfere with the circuit. Yeah. So in this experiment, one on the 19th, um, and again, I'm just going to show you the, the number of experiments I was able to like grab. I was trying to grab ones uh, on the way out in the plane. This I just had uh, these the batteries one through five on uh, had the low value here. Uh, battery six had a high value there. And again, we could we could we could answer we could ask ask the whole question of well maybe they have unequal impedances and they're one's taking it more than the other. But why is it pointing directly at VSM? I, I just asked the question. Because now you had eight arms that could have been pointed to. Why did it pick VSM? Delta V. All of a sudden, this looks like a totally normal distribution. Why is the uh, low arm and the lowest battery on this end pointing directly to the Earth? And why is the high arm, the highest battery, pointing directly at Virgo? I have no idea. But you, don't, you have eight places you could be pointing. Why is it pointing towards those? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the echo arm points directly to the Earth, it has the lowest battery, and it has the highest battery. It's not clustered now. When you run these experiments, do you always have your apparatus in the same orientation no. so that E's always No, no, E's not always down. Okay. Yeah, so we rotate it, uh, especially now since for these experiments, because when, since we uh, instrumented Bravo, Alpha, and Hotel, A, B, and H, the top three, in the morning we would try to follow the constellation and, and the and the sun and the moon as they were going to cross. And then in the afternoon, later afternoon, we had it on the other side. So we would rotate it almost a full uh, 180 degrees or, or more during the experiment so that the ones that were on the bottom actually rotated, the ones that were on the top actually rotated. So we were trying to, in a way, account for some of this bias. And I just only have a few slides left, and then I really like to open up the floor because that's why we really brought it here. And I really appreciate what Jim said. You know, this is a workshop. So uh, you know, this is work in progress. Um, uh, alpha arm points directly to VSM, has the battery low, battery high. Um, this one, C arm, low value, I don't, we don't know if it's pointing anything. Okay, but we're seeing the C arm with this low value. Echo arm definitely is uh, pointing uh, to the earth. C is unaccounted for. The alpha arm, which was our highest arm of all six batteries, if you looked at the all six batteries, that was pointing to the Virgo moon situation. I think this might be my last one, yeah it is. Alpha arm is lowest, delta battery is highest, alpha is pointing to Virgo, and the delta is pointing to the Earth. So I, I, again, it's incredulous, I know, it's incredible. Um, I don't know if, if, if the statistics will bear it out that these could have happened by chance, um, or that we have too many parameters we're looking for, and that's where we're gonna hopefully narrow down the parameters and look at the data better and maybe uh, find something. But we did, uh, for this one experiment, when the alpha arm uh, which was pointing to Virgo, when we looked at it, uh, typically in, almost, in most of our experiments, uh, when Alpha, Bravo, and Hotel had no reactions, all of these sort of just go together. That's basically what happened, because they're all series connection <laughs> to a parallel bus, okay? So a series connection to a parallel bus, it's hard to believe that this string is somehow being voltage supported by something. Uh, and with that, I want to give you a couple quotes because to continue the progress of science, we have to again confront the deep questions about space and time, quantum theory and cosmology. The directions in which progress is being made are taking theory back into contact with experiment. I think everybody agrees with that in this room. And this may or may not be something everyone agrees with, but it says, gradually a solid Machian law of inertia is emerging. And while not yet recognized in the physics community as having high stature, I think, uh, I think it, this person says it's sure to win in the 21st century. Force of inertia is a signpost to new knowledge that underlies the laws of nature. It demonstrates the holistic aspect of the universe, which is due to instantaneous action at a distance. Forces. This quote from the Dalai Lama was encouraging. I'm open to the guidance of synchronicity, and I don't let it expectations uh, hinder my path. And uh, ending with an Einstein quote, like we began, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And so where we are is we're going back to review all our previous experimental data, including this with the revised analysis method of, uh, of actually taking out 
the very information that may have been hiding this, which is that little 15 millivolt rebound, what is your highest and lowest battery, seeing if we could process them against the sky maps to see if there is a correlation in all of them. Because we have 23 experiments where there's a correlation in every one, which is multiple times. I, I know there's a lot of data in there, but there was two hits on, on the Earth arm for every uh, 20, all of the 23 experiments on average, and there was always a hit uh, on average, for the other uh, things, complete the submission of our full patent. Before we published this in IEEE, we took out a preliminary patent. And now we have till the end of this month to finish the primary patent, because we do believe it could be a detector. And, uh, and obviously, we want to build our new real-time wireless sensor array so that the data can come in instantaneously and we can monitor it and not have to do this rebound calculation and these kind of things. But most importantly, while we're presenting it here, we want to build collaborations with other partners. Other institutions, be they you know, academic or um, uh, you know, businesses or governmental agencies, because we think something could be here and it's really cheap to get involved. We, and we, we want to submit the latest results to peer review. And I can't leave without giving special thanks to the people who helped build this thing. Charles Crouchman at the University of Cambridge, Charles Linderman at Rowan, my last school, and Tim Baker at my current school, and the support of uh, Dr. Hope and Garnsey at University of Cambridge and Dr. Schmalz from Rowan University, and the inspiration of this group. You know, without Heidi and Jim and you guys all having this advanced propulsion workshop where we could take our ideas to the next level and have them put under criticism and critique and also have the uh, courage to actually go out and say, hey, look, we're seeing something. What do you guys think it might be? Um, without you guys, nothing would be possible. So these are the references from this paper and the, and the last one. And I thank you for your time. Okay, I'm ready for. What are the capacity of your batteries? Uh, 600 million. Are they all from the same manufacturer? Yes, they're all from uh, Chameleon. I, th yeah. I think is the name, and they're all 600 amp milliamp hours. And we st we did stick with the same manufacturer, and and we do try to. Hi, Mark. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for this uh, uh, enthusiastic presentation. Um, okay. Um, Maybe, uh, just my very first comment. I don't see any relation to a math effect at all. Um, it's, it's very premature uh, to, uh, to say that, and uh, I'm not a general relativity theorist, whatever, but for example, I believe that the billions of galaxies out there, right, they have a much larger influence on inertia than if there is a, a sun eclipse or something like this, right? So uh, there shouldn't be any, any kind of math effect here. It depends if it's relation to R, or R squared. Then yeah, but, but that's really premature. So when, 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 you, when you observe this, Actually, we can we can uh, bring it down to um, you observe some anomalies in battery discharges. That's all there is, right? There is this anomalies with with uh, battery discharges. And so, for example, first thing that you need to do is to have a very good kind of zero test. So, for example, I okay, <laughs> I would say I will guarantee, but but I mean, there's always a certain risk. Replace the load of the gyro with a bulb. You can turn on the bulb uh, uh, with, with the battery and you will see if you will also get outliners. You know, if you have a gyro or not, something like this, right? Yeah. To see if you get also the same distribution or not. Um, so that's... I would say that's a good, that's a good approach. But one of my comments to, to Peter was going to be the thermal effect, <clears throat> how hot, you know, the temperature of the batteries, especially for NICADs, is extremely important. Not a one and a half amps. Okay. What's that? Well, if you put a bulb in there, the heat... Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. He, he, he's saying put it at the same load. Right. He's saying put it at the same light Yeah. Load. Put, okay. put a resistor, whatever. Right. 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 So just, just, just the something, temperature yeah. of being on the top of the ball versus the bottom of the ball. Right. So, you don't think it's a battery anomaly so far. So, <laughs> I make the load. Okay. Yeah. But then, like, the, you know, the discharge time, the recharge time. Yeah. 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 Switch from nickel cadmium batteries to another battery, or even to a super cap, because this is totally different, right? So, this is not chemical storage, this is, this right. is something else. So, so those are, are very, very basic steps um, before, before any claim to mass fluctuation, whatever. Thank you. So it's, A it's complete real-time storage of, of each battery's voltage yeah. would be trivial and provide a tremendous amount of data. It's completely random. Right. Even, for example, yeah. you could have yeah. dust that is somehow influencing the bearings uh, you know, somewhere, whatever. So this is totally 
I will just, I, I will, no, I think I will just say. simply say, you know, Rankin's uh, advice was, uh, you know, he asked, they asked him what he thought when he first saw x-rays and, and held up his hand and saw his bones on the fluorescent screen. He's, they asked him what he thought and he said, I didn't think I investigated. I think it, this is an early investigation. Of course, you can come up with a zillion mundane explanations for everything. You know, uh, but you shouldn't, uh, and, and I, I don't think you should also throw out every new observation by saying, oh, we have a billion new explanations, we have a billion explanations for why this has happened. I mean, this is exactly the reason why, you know, I, I need this kind of input, you know, because I can easily do the kinds of things that Martin's suggesting, like to find out the load of a light, run all the same battery arrays on a load of a light, and, and, and actually see, do I see any kind of this, like, thing where I could point the uh, batteries to any kind of constellation or whatever. And, and again, uh, it's a really good point. Yeah. Just to get rid of the EMF argument, I'd put diodes in. I mean, even yeah. if you're... There. Um, is there, I, I just got a couple things first. Sure. First, as far as the gyroscope con is concerned, since you have two motors driving this gyroscope, or even one motor, um, have you done any investigate or any looking at what the thrust balance of, of the gyro is across the motors, like the gyro doing this, and how it influences the bearings and slowing down the shaft? Because anytime you, any, you know, if you're going to put any oh, resistance sure. in there, it's going to increase the load required by the motor and it's going to drop your battery voltage. Absolutely. As well as when you have the gyro spinning and then you rotate it, it's going to put a torque on those two Absolutely. shafts, yeah. right? Which are going to drive now yeah. two motors. Additional <laughs> friction. Additional right. friction and, and make the loads of the motors go up. Um, and then the other question I had was... No, if you, so the answer is no. Okay, yeah. Um, when you have these batteries, especially rechargeable batteries, um, you know, in a, in a series, if one drops low, the other ones are going to try to recharge it during the discharge of the whole thing. So they're not all uniformly discharging. One's going to feed the other and feed the other and feed the other. You know, the low one's going to drop because its discharge rate is a little different, so the other ones, because they're connected, are going to yeah. try to recharge it. You know what I mean? At the same time, you're drawing down the whole system. So that's going to be a really, you know, you're going to be left with something ultimately that's, every battery's going to have a different charge. Some are probably going to be high, some are probably going to be low at the end of your time. You see what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. And I don't know if that's worth considering or not, but you know, oh, just having these rechargeable batteries, well, just having these rechargeable the batteries, I mean, that's why you see the distribution. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. but at the same time, if there's a positional effect, yeah, you know, the, the, that has to be explained, and I don't think well, the monitoring in real time explained. would be a big, big asset. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's trivial and low cost. Yeah, and, and I, again, you can buy an Arduino. You know, that's a 16-bit processor with lots of memory on it, oh, yeah. USB connection, so it can run on your device, powered by a couple of of batteries, and then you just take it off and dump the data. Absolutely. Great. Other helpful comments? Yeah, well, thanks. One other thing um, that I've noticed is that uh, uh, nickel cadmium cells are a lot less predictable as far as uh, you know the memory effects, even when you're trying to condition them for uh, using them in like RC race, race uh, applications, which is what I was trying to do back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, you know, lithium ion cells, I think, are, are a lot more predictable as far as um, not having the memory effects and uh, being able to rely on them for uh, having a, a predictable loss rate under nominal conditions. So if you do something like this where you're orienting your, your um, test apparatus uh, in, you know in reference to different uh, either stellar groups or the earth or other other uh, mass uh, related things you might be able to get a better uh, a more reliable way of seeing if there is uh, voltage drops or or uh, or not that that could be more relatable to some kind of a transient mass effect yeah, yeah, no, right. Thank you so much. Just, just, just my two cents. Yeah, thank you. So I got a question about some of the, the procedure by which you're measuring the batteries. Um, 
is is the time that you're letting the, the, the thing spin down on its own, is that sufficient for the batteries to kind of, you know, because you know you, you discharge a battery and if you stop the stop the you know the power draw from it, it'll have time to kind of rebound. Rebound. Yeah, that's all we measuring with so that, that five to fifth twelve millivolts. Okay. Uh, but is is the time you're allowing for that rebound before before the time when you shut the power off to when you measure it, is it sufficient to have completed the rebound cycle? Or are uh, you actually measuring it in it definitely situation? doesn't complete the rebound cycle. We're measuring it because we're trying to get yeah. a number as close as, as close as we can to when the experiment ended. That's consistent across the batteries because as you've pointed out, like the batteries, if they're measured in time, because we yeah. don't have a real time system yet, if they're measured in time, they're all in rebound. Yeah, right, right. And so after we get done re measuring alpha through hotel, we go back and measure alpha again and we'll see this five to 15 millivolt rebound. And then we systematically apply that to the deltas that we calculated. And that was when we were actually able to see this emergence of this highly coincidental uh, uh, fringe batteries seeming to be uh, so sen ever, sensing something, uh, a direction as opposed to just random. So did you ever reverse the order at which you measure the batteries? Like if you do, like you said, you, you know, you, you run the experiment, stop the experiment, you take out alpha measure, take out alpha, take out bravo measure, take out, you know, did you ever start with what? the end arm and go backwards? Well, he says he randomizes the batteries when he puts them on the arm. Yeah. So I meant yeah. measuring. Yeah. To measure the, measure the voltage of the oh, batteries oh, post-experiment. Oh, yeah. like, like when do you take them out? Because other ones are going to be sitting in there kind of connected to each right, other. Right, right. Right. So, you know, I was just, you know, trying to for, for a procedure. So, so, so you're, yeah, you're, you're suggesting immediately get them out. What's that? You're saying also get them immediately out so they're not in contact with each other, right? I would, I don't well, know if that would have any... Circuit, uh, that, yeah, as soon as you break the circuit, they're no longer... Yeah, but he was saying that if they were in series, yeah, so, so they can't connect with He's each worried other. He's worried that batteries, the, you're always testing the same arm at, at first. Yeah. He's saying reverse your order. Like test the tell first and work back to alpha instead of starting an alpha. Yeah, it, it, yeah I, I mean, think the only reason why we didn't randomize is because we were concerned about this viewer bias. Like we, we, we had those digital voltmeters and if something looked like something happened, we measured that right away and we were thinking, well, that introduces the bias because you read it first, you're going to get the greatest delta. Okay. And, uh, and then therefore it's like, well, you're looking at, you're operating the machine, so aren't you actually yeah. you know, biasing your data by grabbing that one first? Yeah. And so that's when we got into the idea of, look, let's just read alpha through hotel first and then just try to account for the rebound by reading alpha again at the end so that systematically we wouldn't be introducing more bias because again, like I said, the statistical analysis is not done. All this is is coincidence or or or, or a se seemingly apparent uh, correlations. Which I don't. I do believe that there's enough degrees of freedom in the even in the eight arms that when the statistical analysis, the rigorous statistical analysis gets done, it will hold up that these observations are more than chance. However, uh, you know, I, I take Martin's point, you know, to, to heart. It's like we're we're on a hunt. And the only reason we even correlate it with mock effect, possibly, is because it's been the mock effect that's sort of inspired us on the hunt. Not, and again, all we said in the, even in the title is that these results are indicative of what you might think local, if local, like I, I think there's a lot of physicists in the room who would agree that local mass has a different kind of impact than far mass. Far mass has major kind of impact, but that's a little bit more, uh, Go ahead, Jose. Yeah, uh, a, a couple of words on what Martin was talking about. I think that we can start to use this as a thought experiment to uh, think about what has been discussed in the ESTES conference and what is discussed in this conference. Because people talk about theories and there's no theories there. What you are proposing is to have a direction dependent, that means anisotropic, Mach inertial effect. And the theories that have been thrown around and discussed have something to say about this. So number one, I don't know where Heidi went, but <laughs> the, the, when Heidi talks about the whole Narlikar theory, or I was talking about Franz Dickey or Jordan or any scalar tensor theory, there is a scalar field and there is a tensorial field. And when she talks about the whole Narlikar field, the field that she says that is responsible for inertia is a scalar field. It's a scalar. Therefore, it cannot be dependent on direction. It, do, it doesn't matter how strong it is. It cannot be dependent on direction. So, from that point of view, this cannot be due to the scalar field. Now, the, the Jim's uh, hypothesis is based 
on the 1953 paper of Siama. That is well, but you quote Siama. Well, let's okay. Let's forget. Was let's the one in the early 1950s who called attention to in the vector approximation the fact that the DADT term that appears in a gravito electric field equation can account for inertial effects. So what I'm going to is that Siama's uh, toy theory of 1953 is a vector potential. Now you have a direction dependent. Approximation of general relativity to find exactly the same equation in Einstein's 1921 lectures at Princeton University, republished as the meaning of relativity, starting on page 98 or thereabouts and following. You'll find exact, up to Gothic symbols. But well, the, the point is direction the dependence. Right it, is, it is a vector potential. It is not a scalar potential, it's a vector potential. It's, it's, yes, it's a vector potential. So it's a vector potential, so now you have direction field. dependence. And it's the, the, relativity, the theory of relativity, you, the, the inertial effect, comes from the, it's a tensorial uh, potential. So it now it's a second order, so you, you have even more the direction dependence, you can have quadruples. And the, the uh, Siama himself uh, he said in the first paper of 1953 that he was eventually going to come up with a tensorial <coughs> theory for his uh, what he proposed. It took him uh, something like was like 15 years, and when he came up with the, the tensorial theory, it was a tensor theory and was non-local. So you have from the in, in a few words. If what you're proposing cannot be explained by the scalar field of Horner Likert, it will have to be explained by a direction dependence of inertia, which will, the only ones will be the one in general relativity, which is a, a tensor potential, or it could be a vector potential. It cannot be a scalar field because a scalar field is scalar is not direction dependence. Could the energy of the scalar field be the tensor field? A, 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 again, a, a scalar and a tensor are, diff, are completely different quantities. In, in the scalar tensor theory, Could the you, have, you have both things. You have inertia coming from the uh, tensor, which is called the effective G, and you have the scalar term. And there, uh, there are two particles. The graviton, the graviton is the one, the spin two, is associated with the tensor potential, and you have the dilaton, which is associated with the scalar potential. So if, if you want advocate to have direction dependence, it cannot be the scalar field. So, the scalar not, so from an energy standpoint, they're not uh, coupled at all, they're not weakly, they're not weakly coupled? Oh, coupling. Uh, the, in the Jordan series of 1951, he has coupling in the Lagrangian uh, matter part, however, that violates the weak equivalence principle. So, <coughs> Franz Dicke on purpose and also Horner Likert don't have that coupling because if you introduce that coupling, you have a violation of the weak equivalence principle. There's, there's a, a, an experiment that bears on the whole range of this stuff. It was done by using Drever. Drever is a guy who died in the last year, who probably should have won the Nobel Prize with Thorne and Rainier Weiss this year. Is that Rindler? His name is Ron Drever. Drever. Okay. He passed away. Thorne hired him away from Glasgow in the mid-1970s or thereabouts to start building actual equipment for what is now LIGO. Okay. Hughes and Drever in 1960 did a very careful experiment on what was called tensor mass. The proposition had been floated at the time by Kirkoni and Saltpeter, if I recall correctly, correctly, that if Mach's principle were correct, mass should have a tensorial character, that is should, so to say it should depend upon which direction you measure it in. Okay, and Hughes and Drieger did a very careful experiment which showed that it's not the case. Shortly thereafter, Dickey 
Dickey and somebody else, and I'm, I don't recall who the second author was, they showed that, in fact, that if you have a tensor theory, you do not get tensor mass unless there are two tensor fields present, <coughs> because the field, the alleged anisotropy in the measurement of mass can always be reabsorbed into the tensor field equations. Okay. It's a well-known paper. It's also from the early 1960s. Uh, so nobody these days, to my knowledge, in the general relativity community takes seriously the idea that the amount of mass that you measure an object to have by simple mechanical experiment should depend upon the direction in which you measure it. Uh, that's, we're talking about antique stuff here. Stuff that was done long, long ago. Uh, as far as Brahms and Dickey are concerned, Brahms made a contribution which is still cited, but it's called a coordinate condition in some cases. <coughs> Brahms in 19, it was the centerpiece of his doctoral work with Dickey. Uh, Brahms made the observation that Einstein had made a mistake in that thing that I just alluded to in the meaning of relativity, the lectures that he gave at Princeton in 1921. Einstein was looking for mock type of effects. He had given up on the idea of an action at a distance theory of gravity at the time, but he was convinced that inertia was indeed part and parcel of general relativity, that he had succeeded in building inertia into general relativity without any additional fields or anything like that. Uh, and he came to the incorrect conclusion that if you pile up masses in the vicinity of an object in an isolated laboratory that it should change the gravitational potential energy of the object in the laboratory and that would make it possible to say, oh, the mass has changed, okay? <coughs> what Braun showed was that that's incom incompatible with the equivalence principle because if you can do that, you can observe changes in the charge to mass ratios of things in laboratories without looking outside to see whether there are piled up masses or accelerating objects and so forth. Okay. And that was what led to scalar tensor theory. The Bronze and Dickey came to the conclusion that as a consequence of objects not being affected by the presence of other local objects in terms of their total gravitational potential energy, that Mach's principle was not built into general relativity, but that turns out to be wrong. They corrected a mistake of Einstein and then made a mistake on top of it. <laughs> okay. Because it turns out that the total scalar gravitational potential energy in general relativity has to have the same status as the vacuum speed of light does in electromagnetic theory. Uh, which is that wherever you make a local measurement of the vacuum speed of light, it always turns out always turns out to have the same numerical value. But that does not mean that the vacuum speed of light can be asserted to be a constant in the sense that that's normally taken to be the case, because the vacuum speed of light at the horizon of a black hole measured by a distant observer, for example, is zero. It's the light stops for distance of distant observers. But if you're at the horizon, light doesn't stop it. You measure the measurement it's still three times ten to the ten centimeters per second. That must also be true of the total gravitational potential, scalar potential, for inertia to be built into general relativity. And indeed it is. That aspect of general relativity has been checked. Okay. Yes, John. Isn't there though the there's the argument between the weak equivalence principle and the strong equivalence? And, principle. and the Brans Dicke equation violates the strong equivalence principle because Brans and Dicke succeeded in by uh, having the scalar field uh, not being in the in the matter tensor. They succeeded to respect the weak equivalence principle, but it strongly violates the strong equivalence principle. Uh, 
the clarity on this principle, the, the, the difference just to remind everybody is the weak equivalence principle applies to particles which are hypothetical entities that live in a point in space, while the strong equivalence principle has to do with a uh, real large, uh, finite size body where uh, you have self energy and self gravitational effects. Like for example, you have in this neutron star on these black holes, and the Grandic equation violates that uh, strong equivalence principle. And it is it is arguable whether the strong equivalence principle should be is okay to be violated or not. Actually, uh, we discussing about this rather than to discussing about history. That another thought experiment is to since we're talking about the equivalence principle, let's talk about the elevator. Suppose you have two two elevators. And you put the mega drives in both. If in <coughs> one of the elevators, you have the, MI, the mega drive uh, without being uh, excited at the given frequency. And the other elevator, number two, I put the mega drive and I excited at the frequency like Jim does, let's say at 77 <coughs> kilohertz. Now, according to Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, you're going to have two things. You're going to have an impulse term, which is the one that has been discussed here from the point of view of propulsion, that uh, has the mass fluctuating with respect to time, and you have a, what he calls a one hole term, where you have a, a constant reduction of the, of the mass with respect to time. Now, think about the equivalence principle here. This, the, there appears to be a violation of the equivalence principle, certainly from the point of view of the so-called Warhol term, because you can definitely see now a, a, a difference between the two elevators. But even from the point of view of the impulse term, if I have a very accurate clock on, this, on the second elevator, like a, the one we were talking about where it can measure Q, then you could be able to see a difference between the two elevators, therefore you have a violation of the equivalent principle. Now this was discussed in the conference on, by uh, Barbour on the, on the Mach principle, and it was very interesting the, the <coughs> position that people took. On one hand, we had Clifford Will, the editor of, of Classical Quantum uh, and, uh, and uh, Gravity Journal, that said, uh, is, there, is a, there is a violation of the equivalent principle, and therefore they cannot be, they cannot be right. On the other hand, you have Rindler and, and Bondi that said the following. They said, this is not a violation of the equivalence principle, because in order to apply the equivalence principle, the, the elevator has to be isolated. And according to uh, Mach's principle, it is not is uh, uh, isolated because according to Mach's principle, it's influenced by the uh, external shell. And therefore, Rindler and Bondi said... I'd like to see that bit not. tested by an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> if Heidi has two mega drives in her pocket, we can test that on the way to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the point being is even what constitutes to be uh, a violation or not of the equivalence principle is debated by uh, different people. Possibly we should think we should yeah, go to lunch on that. <laughs> so let's thank uh, let's We're thank you once again for all the for the great presentation.